Hi, and welcome to another Teaching Physical Sciences webinar. Today we're joined by Peter. Hello, Peter. Hi, Helen. How are <coughs> you doing? Okay. Now, Peter, okay. I must admit, every time I think of having you in, it reminds me of inviting a magician <coughs> over. And once again, you, you haven't disappointed. If I look around me, I see all sorts of toys. Looking <coughs> forward to this. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll... <coughs> We'll see the reasons why they work, and uh, of course, it's not magic. <laughs> <laughs> if only there were such a thing as magic. <laughs> and of course, we have Dylan behind the buttons. Hello, Dylan. Hello. And Peter, before we get too much into everything, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay. Um, I work in the field of science and technology education. Um, I work with the Setlari Science Curriculum Trust. We are based at the Radmas Center at Wits University, and we do in-school work. We do classroom evaluation. Um, we do curriculum development. We've done some policy work for the government, and most of all, teacher development. So basically, <coughs> everything. You've done uh, it. <laughs> Am I correct? Is there anything you have? <laughs> Never mind. You don't have to tell there's us what you <coughs> haven't there's, done. There's lots left to do. <laughs> oh, yes. Now, remember that you can win, can't you, Dylan? Yeah. Very exciting. Yeah. If you tweet or send us Facebook uh, messages on the Facebook post on Digital Classroom South Africa, you can win 55 Rand Vodacom airtime. So that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then, of course, if you <coughs> are inspired by anything that we do today and you want to submit resources that link to electrodynamics in a grade 12 classroom to us, watch out for the secret code that will appear at any point during the show. It's like a lottery. It's exciting, isn't it? You've got to <coughs> sit and watch for that code. Write it down and then email us the resource with instructions on how to use it. And that email address is competitions at digitalclassroom.co.za. You can find all of these details on the website at digitalclassroom.co.za forward slash webinars. So it's where you are right now, where you're watching. You'll see there's a little tab on the left or an option on the left-hand side of your screen. And you just go ahead and find it, click it. It'll have all the details. What can you win? Oh, a phone and a tablet. Or, or phone or a tablet. And they're nice phones and nice tablets. It's not little things. It's... Stuff I'd like. Hint, hint. You're not allowed to enter. <laughs> <laughs> Am I allowed to enter? <laughs> You're not allowed to enter. <laughs> oh. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, before we get into our electrodynamics, let's look at Teach Like a Champion. And those of you who have been watching for a while know that I've been reading through this book, Teach Like a Champion, and it has 49 actionable steps. Some of the steps we agree with, <coughs> some of them we don't. And today... I don't. Uh, I've rephrased the step so that I personally feel happier about it. And I'll read the rephrase. It says uh, the step is draw a map. And the instruction is the classroom setup should suit the objectives of the lesson. Basically, that means if you're going to do something that requires <coughs> group work, don't keep your desks in rows, move them around. Or if you're you need to do something that requires going outside. Go outside, do that. It's about the physical management of the classroom. What I didn't agree with, with this particular step, was within the book, he speaks a lot about the default position for the classroom must be in rows. And you mustn't have anything up on your walls because those are just distractions and the students should only be focusing on the teacher. And me personally, I get very frustrated then because you can only go as fast as the car in front of you in that kind of environment. Mm. You're on a one-lane mm. road and the car in front of you is the teacher and there's no opportunity for exploration. If you provide that external stimuli, the, the posters on the wall or links to other websites or anything like that, you're providing another lane for students to maybe overtake you or find another way to get to that knowledge. I... I mm. obviously feel quite mm. strongly about this because I'm just preaching now. <laughs> mm. I'm very sorry. Peter, what are your thoughts no, on I, this? I, I had a maths teacher in when I was in grade 11, and uh, he used to put up posters showing examples of mathematics that we weren't going to do at school 
but I still remember the, um, the, the, the shape of the cardioid and the equation that produced it. So. And uh, I, it said to me, there's something beyond school maths. There's something really interesting out there. Yes. And he, he, he never taught us that, but he provoked us to think, um, how can you create an equation that will create a shape? Yes, I think if you become too limited in the way you set up your classroom and the the material you display on your wall, if you only display stuff that is uh, strictly sticks to the CAPS curriculum and you don't extend them further mm. through those kinds of displays, what's the point? Mm. Yeah. Where does your subject go to? And that's exactly what you're saying, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, what we can offer in school is just a, sl a small slice of what we think is important of the knowledge in the world. And, uh, well, it's, it's, it may be difficult to teach that, but there are a lot of children that are willing to learn a hang of a lot more than that. Mm. And I'd like to leave the world open for them to explore. Oh, very definitely. Very definitely. Because the people who are sitting in your class are possibly <coughs> the ones that are going to go out and build the next big bridge or... Um, work at the SKA. It is SKA, right? That's right. Yes. yes. That's yeah. who you're educating. It's not just a, a group of 17-year-olds. It's the possibility. Yes. 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 Okay. Well, thank you for entertaining that thought. If you have any comments, remember, tweet to the hashtag ME Science. <coughs> you could win. And mm. or make a comment on the Facebook page. Shall we go to electrodynamics? All right. Yes. Now, Let's I have a soft that. spot for this area because it, well, personally, I remember learning it in class. I remember building motors with my father and we had a lot of good time doing that. And it, it made sense to a certain level to me. So it, I mm. like, I'm looking mm. forward to this. Okay, great. Shall we take, you started off your slides with a couple of good ideas, which <coughs> were very good. So let's take a look at them quickly. The first mm. one says every student should make the skeleton motor. The next mm. one, begin early in the year to collect old transformers and motors from repair shops. And the last one says get magnets from loudspeakers, hard drives and microwave ovens. See how to get them out on www.scienceteachingalive.com. Uh, Dylan, can you open that link for us please? This one here. Could we go to the home page of that? The home page of this? Yes. Okay. I should have given Dylan more warning, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a fantastic website. Peter, why don't you tell us a little bit about it quickly? Mm. It's a website with um, videos on it that give practical tips for teaching these uh, difficult topics in science. It doesn't deal with the content. It assumes that, that, that you know the content. But how do you teach it in a way that um, uh, does a lot of practical work that challenges children to do investigations um, and does it with equipment that you can find yourself? We're working on... I, I'm, I'm, I'm busy developing that, that website and we're providing... Um, notes for the leaders of teacher groups who would organize such workshops, um, uh, information uh, sheets for teachers who would come to the workshops, and um, uh, worksheets for students, which teachers can, can develop and extend. <coughs> it's about doing science and not just learning about science. Um, the good ideas that, we, that um, are on that slide are based on the notion that you've, you've got to actually work with the real thing. Understanding the theory by itself might get you through exams, but you haven't actually learned science. Mm. Um, hence the... Um, the, the, the the, the points on that slide make the skeleton motor start collecting stuff early in the year because you're going to need um, you're going to need transformers to look at you're going to need lots of copper wire 
off old motors. Yes. So the student can make their own motors. Oh, just and don't so on. let them steal the copper wire. They must buy it legitimately, <laughs> please. Just a quick question, Peter. When you say um, to collect transformers and motors from repair shops, what kind of repair shops? Almost any appliance repair shop okay. will have motors because um, appliances almost all use them. Microwave ovens, washing machines, dishwashers, uh, fridges, freezers, um, DVD players, and so on. There are motors everywhere. So they don't have to be a certain size or, or anything? Any motor? Yes. Any, any motor you can, you can get hold of. Okay. Uh, motor car, starter motors and alternators from, from garages and so on. Um, they're interesting to look at in themselves. And uh, if they are damaged, then you can get the copper wire off them. Because to teach this practically, you're going to need quite a lot of copper wire for all these students in the class. They're going to have to wind coils right. and armatures of motors and so on. Okay, uh, shall we look at the next slide, which is the six-point teaching strategy? Um, I'm going to read out the first point. Right. It says, revise magnetic fields done in grade 10 and revise electromagnetic induction and the motor effect done in grade 11. We're in grade 12 now. All right. Does, well, obviously, if you put it down there, th that content is important for the section. The section in grade 12 um, on um, motors and generators and transformers is um, heavily based on what was done in quite a theoretical way in grade 10 and grade 11. In grade 10, there's, the, um, there's a section on magnetic fields, okay. uh, fields of permanent magnets, electromagnets, and so on. Um, and in grade 11, uh, there's um, electromagnetic induction. They, um, yeah, they, they're approaching quite a theoretical way, um, but the implications of them are, are not worked out. Okay. And grade 12 is actually the place to work it out, to see how all this lot applies. Okay. Now, to, uh, for, for students to learn this in grade 12 with understanding, you're going to have to go back and revise what was done in grade 10 and grade 11. There's no way that um, after two years they'll, they'll, they'll have those concepts ready to use. Yeah, they are 17 after all. <laughs> <laughs> Other things on their minds. Mm. How would um, you revise it effectively? So would you d do a couple of practical demonstrations? Would you just hand out a cheat sheet? Would no, it need it need to be done. Uh, it need to be done at least through demonstration. Okay. Um, I mean, one of the, one of the things here, um, which is perhaps the sort of thing that that um, your book on teaching doesn't uh, recommend, is this distracting item um, that I've left sitting here, and I sometimes leave it in the class. Dylan, um, have you seen that it's not? glued or attached or anything to that test tube. Let's get in there. It's... Ah, that thing. It's... Ah, it's magic. Why don't I you explain it to us quickly so that the viewers... I leave it sitting there and don't no. say anything. Um, and eventually students say, what's going on here? What, what is this? Now... One, one can take this in, in many directions. For what we're talking about today, it's important for, for students to have that uh, sense of the physical reality of a magnetic field. Um, if, Helen, if you just push down on this, sure. um, it'll give you... It, it'll it's give you quite a lot of resistance. Uh, yeah. Do yeah. push, push it right down, see what it feels oh, like. Oh, I'm scared I'm going to break. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, well, I've done my gym for the day. Okay. Let's yes. <laughs> let it pop up. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the magnetic fields are not just um, lines drawn in a diagram. Okay. Now, <clears throat> um, the, uh, the, the magnetic field is quite different to the electric field. And 
students have got to realize that uh, if you put a, um, an electric charge in a magnetic field and the charge is sitting there and you let it go, it's not going to move along the lines of the magnetic field. It doesn't respond in that way. Okay. It responds to an electric field and uh, it's the electric field that makes a current flow in a wire. Okay. What we've got here is, is not something that's going to make an electric charge move, but it's going to interact in a very interesting way. The magnetic field is going to interact in a very interesting way with the electric field. Um, so we haven't really got time to explore it in, in, in yes. much more detail. But what's in the caps does sort of set out an agenda for what's got to be done. Um, the, the, uh, the magnetic field has a reality to it, and it has a defined direction. That's it. It's important to know the definition of the direction, which is from north to south, okay. as indicated by a little, um, a, a little compass needle. Okay. Um, these conventions are necessary so that, um, so that engineers and scientists can talk to each other and, and develop things. So we have conventions like the field goes from north to south. We have another con convention they need to know, which is that the current goes from positive to negative. That's the conventional current direction. Okay. Okay, those are, those are two things which have, which have got to be revised. Okay. The second point says, teach DC electric motors, make a model motor, and ask students for examples of where motors are used. All right. Um, so we, we're going to have a look at, at, at making direct current motors. Um, and... Uh, but we perhaps we'll come to that in a moment. Do you just want to go through the other sure. the other points? Uh, then teach the DC generator, run a motor backwards, and see the effect on the galvanometer. Galvan okay, well, how a do galvanom you pronounce it? A galvanometer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, point four says most generators are in fact AC generators. So explain the difference from a uh, DC generators and go on to AC, the ESCOM main supply. Point five, revise induction and show how transformers step AC volu uh, voltage <laughs> up and down. Cell phone charges are an example. And the last one says do some problems using effective RMS voltage, effective current, and average power. All right. Okay, we may not get to the last point today. Um, but uh, we'll be able to pick up on, on the others. Um, and I'll just try and talk about some of the teaching issues around those points. Okay. Okay. Yeah, shall we just go on to the next slide? Then? Of course. Sorry, I thought you would, would talk now. Uh, <laughs> the next slide is the pressure points. Now, the pressure points are... Uh, they're points where either teachers or students get stuck either on teaching how to teach or um, a particular <coughs> content point that students get stuck on. So the first one says students are not sure what the field lines represent or why they have a direction because in most diagrams nothing is seen moving along a field line. Shall Can I read through the next one? Yeah, I okay. think we, do, we discussed that one about the magnetic field. Yes. The next one, we might fail to explain the difference between electric and magnetic fields. Yes, I can see how that would happen very easily. Yep. Especially in a grade 12 class, you would expect them to know by now what the difference is between an electric and magnetic field. They, in, in, in grade 11, they do um, electric fields. Yes. And when the field lines are drawn, they have a similarity to the, the field lines around a bar magnet. Yes. And so the, the visual similarity is confusing. Um, there's an important difference, of course, in, in that uh, electric charges don't um, respond to, to the magnetic field. Yes. In, um, in, in the sense that they are drawn like a little magnet. Um, and uh, electric field lines start on positive charges and end on negative charges. Okay. Now, with a bar magnet, you see field lines starting on the North Pole and ending on the South Pole. Yes. But the, um, the magnetic field line forms a closed loop. Okay. Um, 
magnetic field lines form closed loops so around. So they go around like that and you have they, that happening. Yeah, but they continue through the through the magnet. Yes. Yes, you get you get this so it's shape. it's all like that. Then. But it's the 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 loop is closed inside the magnet. Okay. Um, now, when you have a, a magnetic field around a wire, you have the situation of a field line that seems to be chasing its own tail round and around the wire. Yes. There's no pole to to look at, so this can be quite disconcerting to to students who who, who hang on to this idea that the magnet's got two poles and the magnet and and the magnetic field line goes from the North Pole to the South Pole, and that's, that's all there is to it. Yes. All right. Um, okay. Let's take another pressure point. The caps for grade 11 goes into a lot of abstract detail about induction that is not applied in grade 11 or in grade 12. It also does not mention the motor effect that is required for understanding how electric motors work. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're going to have to compensate for that um, to to make this this whole um, unit meaningful. Um, induction is done in in grade eleven in quite a bit of detail, but um, what is the significance of that when you come to generators and and transformers? Yes, um, we need to to work that out. We need to take the implications of um, electromagnetic induction through okay. into grade twelve. Okay. Um, the other thing is that if we're going to teach motors, um, the explanation for why a motor runs depends upon a fundamental effect okay. called, called the motor effect. And that's not done in, in grade 11, so we're going to have to do it. What is induction? Induction is um, using a magnetic field yes. to induce a current to flow in a circuit. Okay. Um, we'll so that's pretty much what this whole section is about, is it? Um, or am it's I about totally it's on no, the wrong no, no, <laughs> track? No, it, 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 it's about induction. Mm -hmm. um, but when we're talking about motors, yes. um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a slightly different angle on it. If you know, if we if we're talking at school level, we're going to have to do motors and we're going to have to do generators. Okay. Um, and generators um, induce a a current which yes. you can draw from the generator. Transformers induce a current in from from one coil into another coil. Okay. And and you can you can draw energy from that second coil. Okay. I just want to ask a quick question. Um, this point is confusing me. It, it says that the grade 11 curriculum doesn't mention the motor effect, and you need to understand the motor effect to understand the grade 12 work. Yes. Does the grade 12 curriculum not provide space to, to explain and teach the motor effect, or is it just assumed that learners know this by osmosis? Um, it, it, it's pretty much assumed. Um, I don't think one can assume it. Where, where would learners get this knowledge from? From teachers who are watching the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess the point then that you're making is is be explicit when you're preparing to teach this work to make sure that you give ample time to teach the motor effect. Because chances are uh, learners are not going to know it or understand mm -hmm. it. And it sounds like if they don't have that knowledge, everything else is going to be built on a, a really shaky foundation. Yes, yes, I think that is the that that's the issue. Okay, so kind of um, you need to step outside the curriculum for a bit. Yeah. To go and teach this, and then mm -hmm. come back into the curriculum mm -hmm. so that you can continue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that the advice? Could could we have a look at the um, the video link that you have? I think it's uh, I think it's the it comes right after this. Yeah. This one. Yeah, this is this is Brian Gray, um, on that that website, Science Teaching Alive, and it's from one of the videos that you can find there. Uh, it's called How to Teach the Motor Effect. Should I play it? Yeah, please. Um, if you've got sound on as well, that'll be great. On it goes. 
From there, I can now very really easily... And in, if you just run it back a bit, I think we've... ...the side and... ...got a magnet, that's the North Pole. Put it near the conductor. When I close the circuit, down it goes. From there, I can now very easily teach them about the left-hand motor rule. I've got my Keep magnetic going. field. Okay. It's coming out of the North Pole. So four fingers field, it's going that way. The current is going from positive, it's going down that way. So therefore, the motion is down, and that's exactly what we saw. Of course, um, I can now got a little piece of the ceramic magnet, and I can use that. I wonder if this is the north or the south face. Of course, we this goes up, and that tells me the field must be coming in. In other words, that's the south pole. Right. Okay. So the that's. Hmm? There's more on the motor effect on that video, and I'd I'd really suggest that um, that the teacher's going to have a look at it. See, what's what's important about that is that you have three forces working. Um, uh, there's, there's the magnetic field, which was pointing away from the magnet that Brian held, and then there was a current which was running along that bit of aluminium foil. Okay. It was running to his left, and then his thumb pointed down, showing the direction of the electromagnetic force, which is at right angles to both the other two forces. Now, what's quite important for the students to realize is that that aluminium strip is non-magnetic. Yes. It's not moving as though attracted by a magnet. Mm. This is, um, it's, it's the magnetic component of the Lorentz force. Okay. The Lorentz force is what you get when electric charges move through a magnetic field. Okay. Just All right. Now, if, we, if we're going to make yes. um, going to make magnets with understanding, then they need to know the the motor effect mm. and how to predict the direction of the of of the electromagnetic force on a wire which is a part of that motor. Okay. Uh, just to confirm, the thumb is the direction of the electric force. The pointing finger is the um, the the forefinger is for the field. Field. Point that in the direction of the the magnetic field. That's from north to south. Okay. Um, the center finger um, is your current. Okay. And is so that the conventional current as well? That's the conventional current, yeah. Okay. And then the thumb, or the T, it's, one usually remembers it by saying that's the thrust. That's the thrust on the on the wire, okay. Or the aluminium strip, or the whatever that current carrying conductor is. Mm. So, uh, four finger is F for field. Yes. Center finger is C oh, for current. Four finger F, field, center finger C current and thumb thrust. Yeah. Yes, I'm only a maths teacher. You have to give me some time to catch on. So. so <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And using the left hand rule, you can predict which way the aluminium strip will move, which then links or is the motor effect. That's the motor effect, yeah. Okay. It, it moves that current carrying conductor. Okay. And that's the effect that is used in electric motors. Okay. Okay. I think I'll I will. remember it now. I've got it written on my hand. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next. Um, Yep. Pressure points says, so we need to compensate, demonstrate the motor effect, teach hand rules, explain why the flux area of the coil matters, and show why it's harder to spin the magnets past wires when you draw current from a generator. Uh, we've only spoken about a left hand rule. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, do we there's use a, the right hand rule? There is a right hand rule for uh, inducing a current. In okay. A and that and would apply to your generators yes, and your transformers. That's right. Yeah. Okay. If you drag a wire through a magnetic field, then you induce a current in that wire. Okay. If it's, if it's part of a circuit. 
Okay. okay. Would you All like right. to add anything to these pressure points? Um, let's pick them up in the next slides and do something to illustrate them. Okay. And the next slide is how to make a skeleton motor. Okay. Yes. Um, That's a good is, drawing. This is some fun. Um, the, the, the CAPS asks the students to make a little motor. Yes. Um, and it, it, it lists some materials there, but I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure how that motor would be made. I've got two motors here, yes. one of which is really quite simple to make, and the, the principles are all there, um, and it's fun. But uh, we need to go a little bit beyond that to explain how a, a conventional DC motor works. Okay. So I'll show you a second motor as well. Okay. Um, Dylan, if you can come in close on this one. Come closer, come closer. Mm -hmm. Oops. Um, <clears throat> what we've got here is, is just about what I drew for that, for that slide. Um, we've got a one and a half volt cell here, and we've got um, uh, a copper wire, uh, paper clips straightened out, the insulated paper clips are a problem. You need bare conducting wire. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a rubber band, or you can use a sticky tape, holding it onto the ends of the cell. Okay. Um, and there's a magnet here. You can see I've, I've marked the north pole. So we have a magnetic field that goes up and curls out like that. There's a, there's a magnetic field going up this way. Now, <coughs> this is the interesting bit. Um, I've taken some copper wire that's um, coated with varnish. The, the copper wire that you'll get off transformers and motors and so on is always varnish coated. And um, you can ask the students why it's important. And um, the varnish insulates the wire. Uh, why should that be? Um, so then I, I wrapped it around the cell and the ends of the wire um, have been scraped cunningly on just one side. Um, I've scraped the varnish off one half of the, the wire. So um, this part has got no varnish, okay. no insulation, and this part does have its insulation. Okay. So when... Oh, just the top half doesn't have and the bottom half does. That's right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Would it be an idea to maybe paint over the varnished side so that it's more obvious? Um, one could. Yeah, one could. But so long as, so long as the students understand what's happened, okay. um, that's okay. Um, <clears throat> one can make this into an interesting investigation. What are the factors that make this work? Now, <clears throat> when I put this onto the paper clips, we're going to close a circuit that goes from here, from the positive, um, through here, through this coil. Where does the, where does the wire go? It goes this way around. It goes this way around the coil. Okay. And then comes out here and back to the negative end of the cell. So we've got a, um, a conventional current going this way around. So we'll have a, a current running in a magnetic field. And we know from the motor effect that the current carrying conductor is going to get pushed sideways. And it's magic, isn't it? <laughs> um, it is. So that's fun. Enormously satisfying Can for I students to, to make something. But it doesn't go far enough. We'll have to make a, a, a more sophisticated one. I'd like to ask a question. Is there any way to slow it down, to slow the spinning process down? Um, yes, there is. Um, there, there are all sorts of variables there. Um, we can make, we can put fewer turns of wire here. Okay. We can put a weaker magnet here. Um, we could even weaken the field by putting an opposing, um, an opposing magnet here. Or um, we could have a, a smaller current. In other words, a, a battery that's going flat. And all of those variables would teach 
various concepts about the the motor effect. They would, yeah. So yeah. you could potentially turn this into quite an, uh, an enriching experience. Yes. Especially yes. if they made it themselves. Yes. It's not just make it and see, gee, was it worked? Yes. Let's move on. Understanding. Why, yeah. yeah. Why, why does it work? Why does it turn this way around? Yes. Instead of the other way around? What would happen if, um, if we reversed the, um, the, 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 the connections in the armature? What would happen if we reversed the field of the magnet? This is, north, this is a north field pointing up. Here is a south pointing. Um, does that make a difference? You know what the I would do in my classes? I would divide them up into groups and I would give them the apparatus to make it and I would say, right, your group over there, you need to make it so that it um, turns three times in a second. Your group, you need to make it so that it turns 72 times in a second or something to that. Just yeah. get different groups yeah, to experiment <coughs> um, and then report back. Yeah, because um, you know, we, can, we can oppose the field that's, that's driving that and um, uh, we can probably weaken it or we can strengthen the field. So there are lots of, there, there are lots of th ways to, to play around with this. Yes. Um, so it's not just let's make it and gee, it worked. Um, why did it work? What can you change? What yes. are the variables here? What are the factors that affect the, um, the motion of this little um, wire coil, which we call an armature. Okay. Okay. Um, so to deal with the caps, um, we have to talk about DC motors in a conventional way. And here is one that, um, Dylan, we'll have to come in close on this one. Um, this is another homemade one. I uh, see so you've got some sheet metal and a block of wood. Yeah. Um, block of and wood and two split pins pushed in there and a bicycle spoke um, between them. Okay. And then there's a block of wood with wire wound around it. And it's insulated yeah. wire. It's insulated wire. Ask the students why it's got to be insulated. What would happen if it was not insulated? Um, and then there's what a effectively is a horseshoe magnet. Um, iron all the way around. Yes. And then <coughs> there's a magnet here with its north pole, which you can probably see on the camera. Um, and then there's a south pole. Mm -hmm. There's a south pole over there. And these are the types of magnets that you would find when you take apart um, hard drives and loudspeakers and things like that's, that. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, microwave ovens have brilliant powerful magnets. <laughs> those, are, those are the big ones that I showed you just now. Um, so we've got a magnetic field going <coughs> this way. Yes. And we have two wires, the two plates here. Sorry, could you just get closer to your mic first? Okay. Um, <coughs> now how are we going to get the current to flow through here? Um, there are the ends of this wire are bare and they are stuck to the end of this uh, shaft here. Okay. Um, they're not in contact because there's an insulator between them. Then there are these two springy bits which you can cut from a Coke can or a jam tin or something like that. And the bare wires touch on these springy bits. What you've got here is called a commutator. The, the, reason for, uh, the reason why we've got a commutator is that if we make this, if we make this side here, um, so that's effective. It turns this way around. Okay. Let's see what the motor effect says. Um, the, the coil is, I can't quite see which way around the wire is going, but let's see, we've got a field this way. Yes. And we've got a, a current, um, 
me just see feel this way, current this way, and we see it turning. Okay, the current must be going this way around. Um, the field is this way, the current is going this way around, and this wire is pushed down okay. at this point. Okay. Now, that's because the current is going this way around. Um, if, that, if the current continued going this way around, by the time it came here, now the current would be going this way, the field is still the same way, we yes. get a force which pulls it down again. So if, if the current just went the same way around, the motor would simply do this and stop. Okay. It wouldn't continue around. So what we've got to do is to get the current to flow, uh, let me see, the current to flow this way around here. Yes. And then when this wire gets to there, it must flow that way so that the force pulls it up. Okay, so you're swapping the current. So the wire must get positive for half of the half of its revolution. Yes. And then as it goes around, it must be connected to the negative. So the current flows the other way. Okay. That's what the commutator does. I know you've got an image for us on the slides of a ah, yes. commutator in detail. There, there it are. is. Yeah. Dylan, if you can um, if you can just run the mouse um, over that shaft. You see there's a shaft in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, now if you if you go to the right along the shaft, there are two little orange, they look like C shaped things. Mm -hmm. Those are the two parts, the two halves of the commutator. Um, at the moment the the left hand one seems to be connected the left hand one is connected to the positive. See the positive down the bottom? And the right hand one is connected to the negative. So um, we can work out the, the way that the shaft is turning. As it turns around, the uh, one half of the commutator is going to disconnect from the positive and it's going to connect to the negative. What this means is that the current will continue to go around the same way and the torque, that's the, the, uh, the electromagnetic force that's making a turn, will continue to work in the same direction. Quick question, if I may. Is it, is it reasonable to, to expect your grade 12 learners to sort of discover this for themselves uh, with some guiding, with some prompting? Or is this something that you kind of need to demonstrate and explain? No, I think you've got to demonstrate and explain yeah. it. I mean, this is, this is a, uh, a, a, an engineering feat of the 1800s. And this they, is, I mean, this is clearly in the curriculum, so this is in the, this is in must the curriculum. understand it. Yeah. But I suppose the demonstration that you have there is what you're going to use to aid the explanation so that they're not just hearing a bunch of words, yeah. they're actually seeing it in practice and actually maybe even just flipping their hand over uh, like this. Oh, you can't see my hand, but... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, U using the left hand rule. Using the left hand rule, and this is, this is what that thing is doing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, I think in 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 this case, it, it one wouldn't expect them to to um, discover it, but um, it would be to exercise these concepts um, of like the motor effect, um, and I think students can uh, can build this kind of thing up. You know, one can get kits for schools, which have got many of the parts, um, and as as Helen did, make an electric motor that actually runs, but then. Yeah, I'm clever. It's yeah. not just following <laughs> a recipe. Um, it's being able to explain why it runs. Yes. Um, and to explain how you could make it run differently. And I was telling Peter earlier that it's one of the few things that I vividly remember from my science class. So it was that enriching, mm. that experience. So I'm all for people making the motor and seeing yeah. how it works. And it's doable. You've got yep. all of these materials second hand. Yes. 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 Um, uh, Peter, we have 15 minutes left, less mm, than 15 minutes, mm. so we might need to prioritize a little bit. What would you like to talk about next? 
Well, let's talk about the fact that you can run a motor backwards and get electricity out of it. Um, and that's the, uh, that's the generator. Okay, so the um, motors we've spoken about so far have been run by, current has been run through them, and as a result, they've turned with, uh, influenced by the magnets in a particular direction. Yeah. Um, a motor is a system that takes energy from an electric current. Okay. And it transfers that energy to a, a spinning armature. And a generator takes the energy of a spinning armature and transfers it to an electric current. Okay. You know, something's just hit me. Is we haven't we've spoken about mo motors, but we haven't actually said why they're useful. At the moment, we're looking at coils of wire that are spinning round and round. But of course, mm. it's not that that's useful to us. It's what's happening at the end over there. That's right. We know we're not getting much work out of this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, what we do with a with a real motor is, of course, that that shaft would be fixed to the armature, and and there would be a pulley or a gear on it or something like that. Yes. With my little little motor here. Um, and here that would then run something, move here something. Mm, here's, here's one. Um, we want useful work out of motors. Yes. So um, um, maybe they just connect on here. Um, <coughs> now, we're not getting it. That's not much useful work, but if we were clever, we could get something out of it. And we find electric motors in all sorts of places. Especially children's toys. That one um, can be taken from any children's toy. That's right. Um, tape recorders, DV drives, hair dryers, um, uh, washing machines, fridges, dishwashers, microwaves, motor cars. Pretty much got them. anything that uses electricity. Almost. <laughs> almost. In anything that moves is generally okay. driven by a motor. Um, your computer's probably got about three motors in it. Um, mm. One of them spins the hard drive all the time. Mm. Um, another motor moves the, the head across the hard drive. Yes. And, and so on. So here we've, we, we are taking mm. energy from an electric current and giving it to that shaft. We can do it the other way around. We're going to give energy to the shaft and transfer the energy to the electric current. Okay. Um, through this clever thing called a generator. So let's have a look at this. So a generator literally generates electricity, makes electricity. It, yes, it does. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it is about inducing. You, you, were, you were raising that issue a little while ago. Okay. Um, we induce a current to flow in a wire by moving the wire through a magnetic field or moving a magnetic field past a wire. Um, Dylan, um, can you just? Um, I can <coughs> hold that. Can you hold that? Yes. Um, this is this is an electric motor. You can see it's got a gear on the end, so we can get useful work out of it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put energy in, and um, uh, we can, can see yeah, the numbers. Can you can you yeah. see the numbers? Yes. Going up. Okay. If I spin it the other way, I think it'll give us negative numbers. Or the other way around. Now okay. Positive. He's now giving us positive numbers. Yes. Okay. And if I spin it this way, it's going to give us negative numbers. Yes. Okay. It's a negative voltage. Spin, Peter, spin. <laughs> 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 okay. So um, a, a motor run backwards mm. um, will generate electricity. And that'll be true for AC motors and DC motors. Um, now we must talk about AC motors. And that's another important part of the caps. Can we have a look at that slide there? This one, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the, the crank handle there uh, is a sign that you've got to put energy in. Um, imagine somebody, uh, imagine you've got to turn that handle round and round. You're turning it around in the direction of those curved arrows, the, the white curved arrows there. And there's a magnetic field from north to south. You see the N and the S on the magnets? Yes. Okay. The field is running in that direction. Mm. Okay. Um, now, there's a right-hand rule for generators. It's called the dynamo rule. Do they also um, use the C, yeah. F, and T? They, they do. Oh, good. Um, for the right-hand rule, it's the, the forefinger 
Yes. Is for the field. Okay. Um, the so thumb that's the same as the left hand rule. Field, field. The the uh, uh, yeah. The okay. The fingers and thumb mean mean the same thing. Oh, good. Um, but the thumb indicates the direction in which the wire is being pushed. So we have got um, we've got the 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 field running from north to south, and then we've got a push downwards of the wire AB, and that means that it is going to induce a current flowing from B to A. Yes. So we've got an anti uh, an anti-clockwise circulation of current okay. around that um, that armature. So if it's flowing from B to A, then we're going to go to um, a slip ring. This is a new new word I've introduced. Um, it's called. Uh, let me see. B. B two. B two. Yeah. Yeah. So um, B two then becomes negative, and because the current is is flowing in this anti-clockwise direction, um, okay. R one is positive. Mm -hmm. um, now as it as the armature spins around, um, the wire AB is going to come up through the field okay. and the current is going to reverse. Okay. Now what we get out from an AC generator is AC, alternating current. The current first goes one way and then to zero and then goes the other way and back to zero. Okay. Um, we pick up those, we pick up the current by those slip rings. You see, we don't have a commutator there. Um, if we had a commutator, we'd be getting direct current. You saw that with a little yellow motor that I was spinning a moment ago, connected to the voltmeter. Um, we were getting direct current from that. It was either positive or negative. With um, an AC motor or generator, we're getting alternating current. And there's a little model that you can use to help the students keep track of this. Um, Dylan, you can, uh, if you can uh, come in on this, um, what we've got, uh, it's, it's a little sheet of plastic and I've drawn the wires. Uh, it's, it's, it's one wire, but I've shown this half uh, in green and that half in, in blue. Now, um, we're talking about the AC generator. So let us say the magnetic field is going this way. Um, towards, towards the camera. It's, it's going towards the camera. Okay, so north right. is where you are. North is where I am, south is over there. Okay. Um, Do you want? Um, okay, let's. Um, we have north here and we have south there. So the field is this way. Okay. Um, and we're going to spin, we're going to drive this. Um, I'm going to use my hand to spin, it, spin this wire through the field. And um, so I'm going to push the wire down. The field is this way, and my center finger, the current, shows that the current is going to go this way around. From okay. green to blue. Go from green to blue. Yeah. Now, if you watch over here, there's a minus sign at the end of the blue. Okay. Okay, because the current is going this way around, conventional current. So I, I keep pushing it around and I'm going to, here I'm going to push the, the blue wire down. Okay, so I'm pushing it down and there's the field. And again, here's my finger showing the direction of the current. The current is going this way. So yes. look, this side has become positive. Can you see the plus sign here? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the blue wire is positive and then it's negative, 
and then it's positive, and then it's negative, and then it's positive, and it's negative. Okay. And so we get an alternating potential difference from this thing. Yes. And if we connect it in a circuit, we get alternating current in the circuit. Okay. So I've just chosen one wire, and I've shown with which way the field goes, and I've used the right-hand generator rule to keep track of just the blue part. And as I push it down, the current goes that way, so this must be positive. As it comes up, um, the current is going this way, so that must be negative. Okay. I know your so next slide shows the, um, the graph of these currents quite nicely. Oh, yes, yes. Let's have a look at that. It's and Sue's Dylan's. Sorry. Sorry, right. Dylan. Okay. Um, there we go. Yeah. AC, uh, DC and AC generators. To the left is the DC, and you see the voltage going down and then up and down and almost bouncing. Yeah. Um, that's like the, the little motor that I showed there. It's, it's, n it's not a very steady current, but uh, of course, with, with real DC generators, they, they put in, uh, they, 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 they change the armature so it produces a much more steady current. Okay, but the one on the right is your AC. Okay. Mm. Okay. Now it's positive, goes to zero, negative, goes to zero, positive, goes to zero. Unfortunately, we only have three minutes left, so do mm. we need to talk about any last-minute ideas, advice, suggestions you mm. have for mm. those out there? I think it's important when talking about generators to go back to that, um, what was done in grade 11. Um, when you induce a current in a, in a coil, um, the coil itself, in the direction of the current that you induce, creates an opposing magnetic field. Okay. And that means that it's going to try to slow down the, the armature that you are trying to drive yes. faster. As you draw more current from the, um, from the rotating armature, one's got, to, one's got to work harder to turn that armature. Mm. You, can, you can see it here in an effect like this. Um, here's a little wind-up torch. If, if there are no lights on, it's quite easy to turn it. If there's one light on, I have to turn harder. If I turn on two, it's, if I turn on all, it's, it turns a lot more difficult to turn. Okay. Now, we've been having load shedding by ESCOM. Um, if more and more people turn on lights and stoves and so forth, the ESCOM generators have to work harder and harder to keep the generator turning because the induced current that people are drawing from the generator is opposing the motion of that, um, of that armature. Mm. And at a certain point, the armature would slow down so much that they couldn't maintain the voltage at the right frequency. Okay, and that's when load shedding would... So, um, and that, that's quite an emergency. So before they get to that point, they do load shedding. Okay. They can't afford to have the, the generator slow down to such an extent that its safety mechanisms trip yes. uh, and just shut it down. Yes. Um, so they're protecting their equipment when they do that, do well, the load shedding. They, yeah, they, they, they're protecting the equipment and a lot else. Yeah, because um, it's, it's, it's not easy to get it restarted. Okay. Um, so they take the load off the generator so it picks up to the normal speed again. Now, this is something that's done in grade 11, and um, uh, it's, it's about the opposing field in a, when a current is induced in a coil. Yes. And we need to take that implication and, and take it right through to real-world stuff now. I think the real world, you're about to lose your test tube there. <laughs> I think the real world, world application is essential for this kind of topic. In, in fact, if I were teaching it, I would start by showing why motors are important and then move on to everything else that we've spoken about, just to give them 
something to invest in. Ah, this is important to me because it impacts my life in this 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 way. Yeah. yeah. Um, an important use of generators now is in wind turbines. Yes. Um, and uh, there, are, there are about 60 wind turbines operating in the country now, mm-hmm. generating I don't know how many megawatt hours of electricity, but it's, it's great to see that happening. Yes. And um, I, I think we should, we should give you as the, the video links to They will to definitely that. be up on the blog. And okay. uh, I know the one video link which is displaying on screen now shows the inner workings of a wind t- turbine as well. It's done very nicely, so... It's worth taking a look at with your class. Right. Now, in terms of the competition that we're running, where you can win a phone or a tablet, all you need to do is send in some mm-hmm. kind of resource that's inspired by this lesson, but not necessarily inspired by what we're doing now. Hear me, I'm a teacher, I'm talking about lessons, this webinar. Uh, not necessarily inspired by what we're talking about. Maybe it's an offshoot, or maybe it's something that you've been doing in your class that really works well to teach these kinds of concepts. You can submit a video, you can submit worksheets, you can submit pretty much anything that shows how you teach electrodynamics in class. Make sure that when you email us, you do include the secret code that was displayed during the during the webinar. And then we'll be choosing winners from the people who make submissions. Yes. Thank you very much for joining us, Peter. I I'd almost be, called you Dylan. <laughs> I'd be very interested to see those submissions from, from I'm from looking forward to getting this. them. I, I hope really to be would. very busy looking through them. Mm. Yeah. No, I'd, 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 I'd like to encourage the teachers to be creative because this is such a, a life important section. Mm. Completely agree. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, Dylan, for all of your input. Okay. And join us again next week when we'll be talking about quantitative aspects of chemical change, teaching it to grade tens. Thank you and goodbye.